It's time for Cannabis Talk A to Z with Frankie Boyer. This is a journey that I embarked on um, several months ago to bring information, cutting-edge information, just information and education, because there's so much that we don't know about this green world, whether it be cannabis or CBDs. We just There's so much unknown, and we are piling through all of the material. We're trying to really uncover layer by layer, piece by piece, to understand that this movement is not going away. And there are many varieties of products and people to help with a plethora of, of problems that our country is having. And so I hope you understand that this is not about, and I say this because if you want to go in a room and pass a joint around, good for you, go for it. But that's not what this show is about. This is not the purpose of this program. With, without further ado, to continue on our educational theme, we have invited Dean um, Petkanis to the show. He is CEO of Canalife Sciences, and his company is doing some exciting research. This is the kind of information that we don't hear about in the news every day, but we need to. And so, Dean, what a pleasure. Welcome to the program. And and tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into Canalife and all of the different um, pieces behind it. Thanks for having me, Frank. I appreciate the time. I started working in plant-based medicines long before uh, the movement in cannabis as a medicament became popularized. Uh, somewhat back in 1992, I involved myself in a pharmaceutical startup that was involved in making an anti-cancer drug. And that anti-cancer drug came from the bark of the Pacific yew tree. It's now known as Taxol. Uh, with that, I was kind of stoked with a lot of knowledge that much of what we see in today's uh, medical corridors is medicine that's based originally from some plant source. And then it possibly synthesized, semi-synthesized, compounded, and put into a dose-dependent form for treatment. So sometime in 2009, many years after the fact, of course, of my experience in uh, both an anti-cancer agent and also in a sickle cell drug, I turned my attention to the medical marijuana markets. Uh, I, truth be known, I was drawn to it by a business partner of mine who wanted to be in dispensing and growing, and I wanted to have nothing to do with that. Uh, you know, I cited many inefficiencies that were waiting for the marketplace. So it's like jumping into a swimming pool without any water, uh, blindfolded. And I really didn't want to go in, into those uh, those areas for yes. many reasons, notwithstanding the, the economic burdens that would come down the pike. But instead, I, I took my base of knowledge in plant-based medicine and I, I brought it forward, theorizing that at some point to rationalize cannabinoid therapeutics, there's a cannabinoid that comes from a cannabis or a hemp plant, and then it's uh, purified and turned into a, a drug mm -hmm. or as an active pharmaceutical ingredient, one would have to start from, from that point moving forward and, and dedicate oneself to the pharmaceutical side of it. And, you know, in some areas, uh, uh, cannabis activists decry the, the evils of pharmaceuticals, but the reality is, is that uh, pharmaceutical companies in America are leaders uh, innovators and uh, producers of some products that have saved lives in, in the millions. So if, if cannabis itself is to become a rational medicine, we have to take the allopathic uh, approach or the Western uh, medical approach of bringing these uh, constituents through the FDA. And so our focus has always been that from seven years ago when we started the company until today, and that was to rationalize what is potential in the plant and get it into a dose-dependent drug-like form, pharmaceutical grade. Along the way, we focused primarily in a compound called cannabidiol, or is better known by the acronym of CBD. CBD, yes. 
And we looked at that as a potential neuroprotectant. And the reason we did that is because we're the only licensee from National Institutes of Health to utilize a government patent that covers cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. And so we said, okay, we've got to focus. Let's look at CBD and see how it works as a neuroprotectant and see if we could make a drug-like or pharmaceutical-grade product that could be moved towards into the clinic, which is phase one, phase two, phase three type trials, much like GW Pharmaceuticals has done, uh -huh. and then you know focus our attention there. And so we started doing that, and in the preclinical work that we did, we discovered some limitations to CBD. And it caught us a little bit by surprise because we're, we're sitting here saying, we want to make a drug from this product, this constituent from marijuana, whether it's from a naturally derived source or synthesize it. You know, the, the, the misnomer is that you have an entourage effect with the chemicals that come from a naturally derived source. But if you purify it to 99%, there's little to nothing different from a naturally derived extract at high purity as it is for a synthetic with the same compound structure at high purity. Noting that, we, we said, okay, uh, what are the limitations? And we went to do something different in the market. We, we sought to improve on the values of cannabidiol as an antioxidant, neuroprotectant, anti-inflammatory agent for some of these diseases we're looking at. And we started to craft and uh, create our own chemical entities, called new chemical entities. And they look a lot like CBD and act a lot like CBD, but there's one major difference in some of the clinical work we did. Well, a couple of major differences. One in particular is it seems to be 400 times safer on toxicity profile, 50 times more effective in an efficacy profile, and has higher bioavailability than CBD. And what bioavailability is is that, you know, how does it track through the body? how much of a percentage of what you take is going to be effective. So solubility and permeability is 67% with our compounds that are CBD derived versus CBD, which is at 8%. So that's kind of like the 50,000 foot of what we've been doing, rationalizing wow. CBD, working with it, knowing what its limitations are, seeing that it still has value, and then going a little further and saying, well, we want to try and improve, improve upon that, that, that so, chemistry that CBD has. And uh, in doing so, we, uh, we came up with our own intellectual property estate associated with those compounds. It's so fascinating. Tell me where you are in this. Have you done any human trials yet? Are you still collecting data? Are you still in the science piece of this? Where are you in this, in this very long road? Well, we, you know, we had uh, much the same problem that many companies had in the last two years, uh, especially in the biotech pharma space. Uh, subsequent to September of, of 2015, the market uh, took a major downturn. The biotech market did. It had been running quite nicely up to that point, and uh, even one of our contemporaries, uh, Zynerba uh, Pharmaceuticals, went public in August only to see its share prices plummet afterwards in their IPO because the, the market uh, it just the, the, you know the market conditions eroded for biotech and pharma, and then you had 2016, which is you know the greatest drama since Bush versus Gore, and so there was <laughs> right. a lot of uncertainty, especially then uh, in the backdrop where the DEA was pending a decision on scheduling. So let's talk about where we are in terms of gap in financing. We've done as much as we could do with the capital that we had to get us to the doorstep of, of essentially going into a human clinical trial. And we had done some other things along the way, uh, which I'll explain in a second. Okay, but when we come back from break, I'm, gonna, just, I'm going to, we need to take a quick break. We'll be back in a oh, moment. Yeah, yeah, sure. this is, no problem. This is um, Frankie Boyer. You're listening to us on Biz Talk Radio talking today to uh, Dean Petconis and his company is Cannalife.com right here on Cannabis Talk A to Z with Frankie Boyer. It's really um, a wonderful conversation uh, combining everything that we hope to educate us, our listeners about 
on this program. So we're thrilled to have Dean with us today, and we'll be back in a moment. Stay tuned. Stop breathing right now. No, really, hold your breath. This is how it feels when you're stuffed up due to colds, flu, pollen, dander, post-nasal drip, or any other reason. That's when you need clear saline nasal spray, the only spray with the power of xylitol. That simple saline solution you're using is only doing half the job. It's just rinsing. In multiple research studies, xylitol has been shown to reduce bacterial adhesion and help keep your nose moist and clean much longer than saline alone, making clear more effective at washing away that nasty gunk in your nose. Clear is so powerful, it's been granted over 11 patents. So step up from that wimpy saline spray to something that actually works faster and better at getting you the relief you need to start breathing now. And if your doctor isn't talking to you about clear for your congestion, maybe you need to get a new doctor. You don't just rinse your hands, why would you just rinse your nose? Clear saline nasal spray with xylitol. Available at Walmart, CVS, Whole Foods, Rite Aid, and everywhere else. Or clear.com. That's X-L-E-A-R dot com. Now go wash your nose. And welcome back. It is Frankie Boyer. This is Biz Talk Radio, and it's our Friday edition where we talk about cannabis, CBD, and we're doing it today with with our, our guest. And it's, you know, this is a, a wonderful story about a startup that's getting into plant technology and combining um, combining both worlds and this is really where we see the future for many of us. We see the future of, of, of this plant and how it could really and truly help heal. And we will continue our conversation today with Dean um, Picanis. And Dean, welcome back. Canalife.com is the website. I, I, you were just sharing with us a little bit about the, the, where you are in this, in this uh, road. Four trials. Sure. Uh, I was uh, I, I was saying that uh, the the markets uh, tend not to operate in tandem with your your highest aspirations and hopes. So 2016 was a very uncertain year. You had a lot of cannabis related funds that were driving uh, investor monies into buckets with the hope that the DEA would reschedule marijuana and then it would be a heyday for a lot of these funds, these newly created funds. And many were looking at us, but most were really trying to establish themselves with growers, dispensers, participants in state licensed opportunities. And you know, ours is a completely different road. You get through the FDA and you're in all 50 states and you're in the international markets. So you know, we, we tried to get that point across to the marketplace. They just didn't really want to understand it. Then all of a sudden, in August of last year, the DEA said, not only are we not rescheduling marijuana, but stay tuned because we have an update on yeah. the scheduling of cannabidiol, and that came in December. Right. And that came right after the election. And so the political and regulatory landscape changed in a heartbeat, and a lot of these funds are now stuck with buckets of money, probably having to refund a lot of it because you can't deploy that capital. And what happened after December and the rescheduling uh, that took place for cannabidiol and, and cannabis-related extracts is that our phones started ringing off the hook. We started to get a tremendous amount of individual investor interest. What are you going public? What are you going to do? How do we make an investment? And then funds started to, to come off the sidelines and wanted to understand that uh, – you know, they knew, they wanted us to understand that they knew the direction of the market and that it's now decidedly tilted towards the pharmaceutical side of things. And there's a paucity of companies out there. Some of the reviews that we've gotten from funds range from you know, the best we've seen internationally as a private company in the space to, well, you know, let us be your banker. We, you know, we think that there's a real opportunity here. So... While it took a little bit of extra time after our preclinical studies have been performed, we're now in position, I believe, to raise the kind of capital that will push us into uh, phase one trials, and then uh, we can then start moving uh, the chains uh, judiciously through clinical trials and, and hopefully getting the results that we think that we're going to get. And that's both for CBD and uh, our target drug candidate, uh, KLS 13019. Uh, so I, I want to digress a little bit and tell you that along the way, while we've done a lot of preclinical work 
in neurodegenerative disease like hepatic encephalopathy, which is a brain liver disease. Uh, and there is a story there as well, which regards to the genesis of our company. Uh, but uh, along the way, our, our research partner at Temple University took our lead compound, uh, O19, compared it against CBD in an area focused on chemotherapy-induced neuropathic pain. Yes. And so we know many that have to uh, take on chemotherapy to fight cancer develop these neuropathies. Uh, and neuropathic pain is very, very different than somatic pain, which is kind of like the ouch pain you get or dental pain that you get. Uh, or, or, you know, a traumatic injury that causes pain. Neuropathic pain is completely different. And so when they did a side-by-side -side with uh, CBD and O19, they said, hey, you, you, you guys better start paying attention to your own drug. And we got excited about that, obviously, because uh, if we can help people along the way improve on their quality of treatment uh, in the instance of cancer, uh, and what cancer and chemo does, it, you know, pain associated with all of that reduces appetite, reduces a, 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 a track to wellness. And so we think that that's an opportunity for us. And that may be uh, the first focus for us in, in a clinical application. Uh, going back to the other disease, the brain liver disease of, of hepatic encephalopathy, uh, you know, we have uh, presently filed for orphan designation with the FDA, and we're pendency there. Uh, we think that there's a real opportunity there as well, and uh, that's a disease that, uh, oddly enough and coincidentally enough, uh, afflicted my, my, my co-founder's father, uh, unbeknownst to me when I focused on that disease for licensing with oh, wow. National Institutes of Health. So I have a personal uh, agenda here to see to it that we bring a drug to the market to treat that disease. Uh, and along those lines, experts like Roger Butterworth, who are experts in the HE disease, uh, had told us that, you know, really nobody's working on the neuroprotective side of that disease. So what, what does that disease do? Well, when, when the liver goes bad, vis-a-vis uh, -vis alcohol or non-alcohol related uh, decomposition, cirrhosis, hepatitis C, uh, portal hypertension, the liver sends these ammonia toxins through the blood and they collect in the brain and there's where your, your neurodegeneration comes from. Well, if you could protect the brain from those toxins and the, the, the healthy neuronal cells in the brain, uh, then you're doing something that the current standard of therapy for HE doesn't do. And so we focused on that, and, and, and these are exciting applications. And by the way, CBD does do that. CBD is a neuroprotectant. Uh, KLS 13019, a CBD-derived molecule, is a neuroprotectant, and we've established that in preclinical. So this next round of funding that we're doing right now that we're getting interest from, that'll push us into the clinic and uh, get some results, and I think they'll be exciting. So realistically, when do you see... If, if things start to move along, uh, when do you see the product being available and, and uh, the next steps in, in the next uh, hard five to say. years? You've got to get through uh, at least phase two. I mean, it's going to be several years. Uh, but if there's an opportunity in rare disease uh, such as HE and uh, compassion care comes into play, as long as safety and efficacy is designed through phase two, there's a possibility of coming out early for compassionate use. I, I would say given t today's environment, you know, 2017, our funding is right around the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, we get into the clinic overseas in 2018. I would say by 2021, uh, we should have, uh, we, we yeah. should be out early with a drug in the marketplace. Well, I have to say this is fascinating. Please keep us posted. Come back anytime, Dean, because this is such a great story. Um, okay, how about tomorrow? Really <laughs> canalife.com is the website k-a-n-n-a life.com and it was a very uh, fascinating half hour with you thank you so much for being with us and educating all of us to the work you're doing my pleasure Frank Have a great and day. we will be back in a moment this is Frankie Boyer Biz Talk Radio Cannabis Talk A to Z with Frankie Boyer stay tuned we'll be back in a moment
And welcome back. It is Frankie Boyer. This is Cannabis Talk A to Z with Frankie Boyer on Biz Talk Radio. It's our Friday edition. It's an opportunity for us to really talk, as we just did with Dean, what a fascinating story of how he's taking um, CBD, adding some ingredients, and making a pharmaceutical can, that can help cancer patients. There is so much development in research going on. And our next guest is one of the, is, is really on the pulse of it. He's with New Hope Network, and he is the ingredients and supplements editor for New Hope Network. And he's with us today, and Todd Rumstad is, is with us. And Todd, you've been writing about this now for a couple of years, numerous articles about CBD, about cannabis, and it's a real pleasure to have you with us. Thanks, Frankie. It's awesome to be here. Let me ask you from your perspective, because this show is about educating people. This show is not about, you know, as I always say, it's not about, you know, um, a fun, salacious show about getting high. You know, there are many of those out there on the Internet, and this is not one of them. This is a, a real serious endeavor that I've embarked on to really and, and truly try to educate people that, this is not one size fits all, that there are many uses, many applications. And so can you share with us from the writings that you've done? First of all, give us an overall of what you feel the country is understanding about CBDs versus um, cannabis and, and the, the distinction in products that are now being seen in this country. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, so CBD, it's it's not considered traditional medicine, but since it doesn't provide a buzz, it's not really a street drug either. It's but but it is a drug. It's being explored by that, and it's it's got some preliminary FDA approval, which is a whole other can of worms we can get into. It's also an herb. It's a supplement, uh, and it would be considered a blockbuster supplement <clears throat> if it was derived from any other plant in the world besides cannabis, and uh, <laughs> it would be considered a miracle cure. Um, yeah. It would be a blockbuster supplement ingredient, you know, as big as ephedra, um, but because it's got that bad cousin THC, you know, another cannabinoid, uh, the most infamous one, uh, it everyone's sort of in an uproar about it, and yeah. so it's uh, it, it's also it's sold in the widest variety of sales channels of any product of all time. <laughs> it's you can get it in health food stores, you can get it in physician only lines, you can get it online, uh, and then you can get it in medical as well as recreational or adult use dispensaries. You can get it in smoke shops, you can get it as a pharmaceutical. So it's really, it, it, it's a unique product, it's a unique ingredient in the history of world commerce, <laughs> actually. And uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of concerns people have. Just we, you know, we here at New Hope Network we talk a lot with health food store retailers, as well as consumers, and then manufacturers and ingredient suppliers. And the concern that we that retail has is they get questions from customers: Is this marijuana? Will it get me high? Will I fail a drug test? How will it make me feel? Will it cure? X, Y, or Z, what's the recommended dose? You know, th there's a lot of sort of uncertainty in the market. People, you know, there is that buzz. I, I, I hate love to use that pun, but th there is there's sort of this cultural buzz around it, but it doesn't get you buzzed, you know, from a physiological perspective. And, uh, and, and so people don't know that. So there's still a lot of education that needs to go out there. You know, it. I think it... CBD became sort of a, a product of interest. Certainly here in Colorado, we're out of Colorado, which was, of course, the first state to sure. legalize marijuana, you know, for, for the fun of it. Uh, and, but it would, uh, it, it gained this cachet of helping with epileptic seizures, especially child onset epileptic seizures. Right, and I so think everybody, was, the, the early days when we were watching Sanjay Gutta um, yeah. and his weed one, two, and three, it really evolved from that from that series, and we saw, you know, Charlotte, and it's it's now become, 
very, you know, it's become infamous from that from that original story that got all the yeah. buzz. And so we've come a long way from that those days in many in many ways because 40 states in these United States have some form of legalization. And That's right. About nine states have made it um, legal for non-medical use as well at this point. I think it's about nine yeah, states. And, well, you know, and also 17 of the medical marijuana states, it's only CBD only. So they said yes to medical marijuana, but it's not the THC smokable marijuana. It's only for CBD. So, yeah. and, and, and those are the, the most recent ones, and those are basically the red states kind of in the south who finally said okay maybe there's some there there will give will will pass medical marijuana but it'll only be for that cbd thing that we hear is good for epileptic seizures um and and then so it's interesting on individual states they will legalize it for a variety of different health conditions and some states have maybe only nine health conditions some illinois has 40 different health conditions and, uh, you know, so you hear anecdotes of people taking it for sleep, and in retail stores, they they will categorize it in their inflammation supplements or maybe joint pain or maybe just general health supplements. I, I heard somebody say the difference between THC and CBD is CBD, CBD makes healthy people healthier or it keeps healthy people healthy versus the THC medical marijuana, it's, you know, you've got a sleep issue or you've got some sort of, a, you know, tr traumatic syndrome or something like that that you would like to take for, or general pain, you know, that that's sort of the big, that general pain is kind of the catch-all for both THC and CBD, um, mm -hmm. so it kind of crosses over there. Let me ask you, as a writer, reporter, you've been covering this for, for a few years now, what's your biggest... Um, what do you think is the biggest problems that we have in this country getting this on to mainstream? You, you said it brilliantly in, in the first uh, few moments that if it were made from anything else but the cannabis plant, it would be huge. So how do, how do companies work against that? And it just seems to me that there's so much education that is needed. Well, there is, and there is, uh, there is legal and there are regulatory issues that make anyone who's interested in getting in the business know, you should know that it's, it remains a high-risk endeavor. And this goes for both THC-style pot for the fun of it, as well as CBD. Um, and, and actually, in some ways, the legal and regulatory ground is dicier for CBD than actually for THC marijuana. And uh, so that's, that's very curious. And, and really what that shows is how the American medical system is, is really controlled by pharmaceutical interests. Yes. And there, there's, uh, you know, th there's a law on the books where if something is a dietary supplement, like say fish oil, it can then go on to become a pharmaceutical drug, you know, by prescription only and subsidized through your insurance, which the prescription drug is called Lovaza, and it's basically just a high concentrate of fish oil. But if something is ever a drug first, then it can no longer ever become a dietary supplement, and that is exactly the issue with CBD. There is a That's British amazing. company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there's this British pharmaceutical company, GW Pharmaceuticals, that filed a petition with the FDA back in 2005 that they wanted permission to study it as what's called an, inde an investigational new drug, an IND. And this isn't the traditional way for drugs to get approval, but there's a little proviso in the law that says, hey, if nothing else works and you want to try something, you know, in the face of nothing else working, give it a shot. And so GW Pharma, they, start, they filed it in 2005. They started studying in 2007. Last year, 2016, they published three studies, and they're all on child-onset epilepsy disorders. And so there, there, will, there will be a, a titanic legal struggle around this because the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. interests say, hey, wait a minute. 
uh, you can't sell CBD in smoke shops and in online and boy. In so we're shops. ready for, and then and then there's the category one uh, as a. That's we're get we'll yeah. get into that in just a moment. Todd, what's the best website for people to find out more about some of the articles and the work that you've been writing about? You know, I work for New Hope Network. You could just go to newhope.com, N-E-W-H-O-P-E, and uh, just search for CBD. And you know, I've we'll be back with Todd in just a moment. A this is yes, we'll be right back. This is Frankie Boyer. Stay tuned, Biz Talk Radio. This is our Cannabis Talk A to Z show, an educational journey and odyssey that we've embarked on. We'll be back in a moment. Stay tuned. And welcome back, Frankie Boyer, News Talk Radio. This is Cannabis Talk A to Z with Frankie Boyer. And we are in the middle of a, a fascinating, absolutely fascinating. This has been such an enlightening show today with uh, our editor of uh, Ingredients and Supplements, uh, Todd, Todd Runstad. And we've been talking about the legalities. We've been talking about the, the issues that plague just CBD. We're not even talking about cannabis. We're talking about the non-psychoactive um, ingredient from hemp. So right now, Todd, welcome back. This is really fascinating. We could we could spend hours talking about this. By the way, you know it. You know that, and I know that. It's it's just yeah. such a so much information. But I can put hemp protein in my in my shake, and I can go and buy my hemp protein. And my hemp seeds at um, Trader Joe's, at at Whole Foods, at Nutiva, at at all anywhere I want to go, I can buy. It's legal for me to buy hemp seeds. It's legal for me to buy hemp powder. Now, it's illegal for me to buy a hemp towel, hemp nightshirts, because hemp was such an important industrial product in this country it's for legal so many to years. The it's legal to write the draft of the U.S. Constitution on hemp paper. That's right. And uh -huh. there's even hemp ice cream. But for whatever reason, and hemp has taken this, hemp has had a resurgence in the past few years. I remember, I, I always go back to my dear friend Lynn Gordon, who started French Meadow Bakery Bakeries and her uh, functional bread. She was the first in the world, I think, to come up with, with a hemp a hemp bread that was hemp seed bread which was out of this world way back when it was a functional bread and she had to go through hoops um, to get the clearance to do that but she did it and she broke a lot of grounds and hemp has been used uh, for for I'd say a good 10 years now but it's as you know when we go through our big trade show and our, our last trade show how many people showed up at that trade show 88,000 people or something Yep, yep, in the 80s, yeah. yeah and and, and those are all just professional people. Those are not consumers. This is not for consumers, so. right? I was just going to say this is, it's one of the largest, if not the largest, trade show, and I, it's just extraordinary what, what happens there. But, you know, you and I both could go up and down the aisles and see a ton of hemp products this year, hemp drinks, yeah. hemp milk. It, hemp has just taken over. Yeah. Well, and, and that that victory did not come easily. That was uh, a huge court battle That's between right. the, uh, the the Hemp Industry Association and the DEA. The That's DEA right. wanted to keep hemp illegal, and um, the hemp John, commercial interests. John Rusak and, and Lynn Gordon and Dr. Broner, and they really exactly. fought very hard and, and broke through. Yeah, and, and they had, you know, an impartial judge had to educate the DEA that hemp, nutritional hemp, is not marijuana. And, uh, and, and those sorts of battles continue to this day. And, uh, you know, and so there's a couple different aspects. One is the, the 2014 Farm Bill allowed states to grow their own hemp. Mm -hmm. And so now you have Kentucky, which used to be a center of tobacco growing, but all those tobacco farms have gone out of business. They know how to grow stuff. And so now they're growing hemp. And so Kentucky is the leading state exporter. And then you have Colorado, um, which is also a big grower. But Colorado is not an exporter of their hemp because 
Colorado people like to consume hemp in various iterations, whether it's hemp powder, hemp seed, or hemp-derived CBD. So uh, that's all very it's interesting. So, it's, it's so interesting. Where where do you see this going? Do you do you see the um, classification of CBD changing soon? Well, you know, the uh, GW Pharmaceuticals, they are, because they published three additional studies last year and they're looking for more this year, they hope that by the end of this year they will get uh, FDA to say, yes, you can, we, we can qualify CBD as a pharmaceutical drug. And boy, when that happens, that that will represent the FDA trying to take away people's CBD. Will the people tolerate another federal agency trying to restrict access for which people sounds like a regulatory tech, you know, technicality? So that's going to be a big case. And then so it, it, and when that happens, when that announcement comes, there will be court cases. And uh, and. I don't know if you want to get into the legal technicalities. I know we just have a couple minutes. No, but we just have a few minutes left. Yeah. yeah, it will be you know, fascinating and, uh, to see. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, w w every time the supplement interests battle the FDA in court, the supplement interests win. So, you know, common sense prevails over sort of the regulatory, in this case, reefer madness. You know that that still exists on the regulatory level. I mean, cannab marijuana, cannabis should not be rescheduled from Schedule 1. It should be descheduled, you know, like yes. tobacco or alcohol. That's not on any right. schedule. That's right. really where it should happen. And there's, uh, you know, Oregon congressman is working on legislation that will do just that. We'll see about that. So, uh, you know, the, the game with well, CBD, you know, the game I with think marijuana is not over yet. I think it's so fascinating as we watched the news this past week. We saw two stories in the news. One was a, or last week, one was a young young boy at Penn State who um, had died from alcohol poisoning, among other things, but had been given too much alcohol at one time, and his body could not could not sustain it, and and then he fell, and no one got help for him. And the second story is a young 16-year-old who had too much caffeine in a short amount of time that also died. So, right. you know, uh, to think that this hemp could kill someone is so ridiculous because that's the one thing is that you will, there are no bodies from hemp. There's no bodies anywhere Yes. from the use of hemp. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, again, it's just the, uh, the leftover detritus from reefer madness that permeates yes. so much of the establishment. And, it, it, and that's know, why I'm doing marijuana. this show. That's exactly why I'm doing this show, because I want, I want people to, to get a feel that there's so much more, and that's why I wanted you on as an editor and as someone who's been covering this field. And, and to be continued, Todd, let's continue this conversation. It was a real pleasure having you with us today from New Hope. And we will be back next time. This is Frankie Boyer for Biz Talk Radio, Cannabis Talk A to Z. Thank you for listening. Make it a great day. And as always, smile. <laughs> Thanks, Frankie. Thank you. Oh.